Koto. Hello, everyone. Hi to Mai, and welcome along to my showy ovaries, a podcast where I, potentially plunging into the pit of perimenopause, Penny Ashton, do all I can to learn about the plethora of possible symptoms before my estrogen levels plummet. Oh, actually, I think that has already started. A reminder that I am not a doctor or a pharmacist, though I did win a chemistry prize at school once, but burning magnesium ribbon in 1991 isn't much use here, so please do seek out medical specialists if you feel you want to start up any official discussions around your bits. Hopefully they're not on fire. My guest today isn't a doctor, but is a woman who has no doubt done millions of hours of research in her long, illustrious career as a journalist. From the Warocknabeel Herald to the Melbourne Herald to the BBC, then after a move to New Zealand, everywhere from Breakfast to Fair Go to Prime to Seven Sharp to One News to Radio Live, and now in her frankly fucking marvellous work with stuff on the Me Too movement, please welcome the fierce intellect and take no prisoners charm that is Alison Moore. Hello. Oh, hello. Kia Hi there, bye. Kia uh, Thank you for that. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I'm wonderful, thank you, if a bit hot. It's quite hot yes. at the moment. It's very muggy, yes. In, in fact, the word of the day today in Wordle was moist, which feels entirely applicable. Oh, <laughs> everybody's least favourite word, <laughs> right? So they had to throw that in at some point, I'm sure. Yes, more. I know, it's, it really alienates people, that word, mm. moist. Mm. It's like panties is another word that I don't like panties and if you put the two together then that's a whole thing. <laughs> it's generally an americanism <laughs> but moist is universally loathed yes that is true isn't it but there are probably some women out there who wish their vaginas were a bit moist right now who are possibly menopausal oh it could be could be <laughs> let's all pause and think about that for a while. <laughs> so how are you finding being in the red light how is that doing is that doing anything for you it's fine. I've discovered my inner hermit throughout COVID and I have withdrawn to West Auckland, to rural West Auckland. And I find uh, I'm making a documentary at the moment, which is kind of separate from my normal work. And I've had to go into town a couple of times in recent weeks for the first time in months. And I'm really overfaced by, well, not even crowds, just people. <gasps> Too many faces over you are overfacing you. Right. Uh, it's really it's really quite quite strange because I got used to it just being me and the dog and more latterly the horse in the paddock and yeah. Yeah. My husband and I went to Point Chev Beach for a swim and he got freaked out. Even though we're outside, outside doesn't bother me as much, but it's just people. And when people are my whole audience and stuff like that, it comes quite confronting. You know, my whole thing is people, entertaining people, being people being there. And when people start to sort of be a threat to you, it's interesting. And the whole of New Zealand's going to have to go through this massive mind shift now, of course, as well. Mm. Mm. With Omicrominus lurking on the horizon. Oh, such a good word. Such a good word. Thank you very much. <laughs> I should be a poet. Look at that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So anyway, I have got a longer introduction for you that I will do now. And then we can get into the meat and potatoes of the meat of the ladies? No, that's horrible. Right. Okay. So here we go. Alison Moore was born on Valentine's Day. So it's nearly your birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. Into a family of journalists in Melbourne in 1965. She followed in her dad and granddad's footsteps at the tender age of 17 and started a cadetship in the Warocknabeel Herald, which suffice to say, wasn't a career highlight. From there, she moved to the Melbourne Herald then to London and the BBC, and finally to New Zealand in 1993, where she has been a mainstay of screen, radio and broadsheets ever since. From presenting the news with some guy called Simon Dello and being condescendingly called the Ken and Barbie of New Zealand television, to sitting next to the Dennis the Menace of New Zealand television, Paul Henry on the breakfast couch, to working on Seven Sharp and her beloved Fair Go, to stuff via talkback radio. To me, she has shown the evolution of women in the media, tenaciously fighting to be taken seriously, often given fluff pieces while the men did the serious stuff, her intellect judged negatively because of her blonde beauty, but through it all, rising above to be professional, warm, funny, dogged, determined, 
taking no bullshit, sharp as a tack, and now sticking it to anyone who takes advantage of anyone's bodies in her work in the Me Too space. So once again, huzzah, please welcome Alison Moore. Oh, you're Hello. too kind. Hello. Thank you. Oh, stop, stop. No worries. So <laughs> when you hear all of that laid out like that, does it make you, do you sort of ever sit back and reflect and think, oh, yeah, I did that? Yeah, um, I, I suppose I do. Um, occasionally I'm, I get a, an email from a publisher who wants me to write it all down and that, that often prompts me to... Yeah, writing your bio. ...to sit back and go, whoa, I'm old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been at this a long <laughs> time. <laughs> you have achieved much. You have achieved, And you've gone across so many different mediums. Has that been fun? Has that been a challenge you were up for? Is that just how it happened? That, that is just how I am. People occasionally email me. I got one the other week that said something like, oh, you're just better because you're not on television anymore. <laughs> and I said, Doug, uh, I said, I'm not the sort of person that, like, please don't feel sorry for me because I'm not the sort of person that can sit in the one job for 20 years. I just, I, I just couldn't. That's not me. Yeah. I like the fact that I've been able to have a go at pretty much every mm. medium that there is in the media and hopefully mm. make a, a go of all of them. <laughs> I'd say so. Surprisingly, it surprised me that I loved radio. Radio was one of my very favourite things to do because it's a very, or you'll know this, it's a very intimate mm. exchange. So mm. it, when, mm-hmm. you, when you work in television, you tend to think of your audience as a family or a group of friends sitting watching you at the other end of the television tubes. Whereas radio, you're literally talking to one person, whether they're driving in the car to pick up their kids or whether they're on their commute, whatever it may be. It, it is a very intimate relationship and, uh, and I really enjoyed that. Mm. Very creative radio, freeing. Mm. It's been interesting. I've been on Radio New Zealand doing the panel for like the whole time, so it's nearly twenty years. Oh my goodness! I love you on the panel. Oh, thanks, thanks. It's actually what's it's really crafted my political persuasion. Actually, the panel. I when I had to think about what I thought, Mm. I realized I thought quite a lot about what I think about, and Mm. and and the bent that I go on. So yeah, it's like I thank Jim for my left my left wingedness. (laughs) But it was quite funny. Like I was on Magic Talk hilariously doing uh, social commentary last year, and that was funny because I knew that my audience was not listening to magic talk. <laughs> it was like, and it was quite freeing that time because I just didn't give a fuck I was like I was left as which obviously hurt many magic talks souls that were listening but mm. it was it was actually really freeing as well and that's the thing you've got to be honest because it comes you can tell when you're not yeah well don't forget that I did a show on magic talks predecessor radio live with Willie Jackson so yes there's a a left-wing spectrum for you and you're right a lot of their a lot of their listeners didn't agree with our viewpoints Yeah. yeah but I think that's one of the reasons why I left actually that radio station was because um it was plain that there was a move to the right but let's not go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> hey? Yeah. <laughs> let's move along. Move along. Let, move let, along. let me tell you about all the ways I've been made redundant over the years, like four times now. <laughs> four times you've been made redundant? Four times. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what the media wow. is like. The media is a brutal, yeah. you know, and traditionally, particularly for women, it's quite a brutal space to yes. work in. Yeah, and it's bullshit anyway. You know, we've got Bruce Forsyth presenting television until he's weakened at Bernie's and at, sorry, not speak ill of the dead. But he was presenting until he was practically 100. But apparently 50 is, yeah. Anyway, um, now I remember back when I, because we met when I was doing social commentary on The Breakfast Couch and Correct. and and then you came and did a bit of your first stand-up in my diary show that you sort of read from your diary. <gasps> that was so embarrassing. Oh. You did really well. You oh. did really well. <laughs> you did really well. But I remember you telling me at the time that you would get really frustrated with Paul getting all the serious stories when you didn't. And I just love that what you've done now is that you've turned that on its head, as it were, and the very things that you are doing that are so weighty and so substantive are about sexism. So you like, fuck you to the people that were <laughs> sort of relegating you to the fluffy place. The fluffy place, that, even though the fluffy place sounds nice. That, you know, but anyway, I love that. And have you sort of ever thought about that or was that part of your motivation? Uh, I think that 
being told no you can't do that is a powerful motivation to, to somebody yeah, like totally. me because yeah. I just go mm. nah of course I can and I'll just have to show you that I can so yes yeah but I think things have changed certainly in the television world there's still a number of challenges like you know pay equity for example in television mm-hmm. presenting yes, that haven't been properly tackled but I think we are further along the line we no longer give female reporters exclusively the the fluffy stories and I think if you look at somebody like Tova O'Brien if you tried to give her fluffy material you know you might I don't know lose a hand yeah I think you'd be physically harmed I do <laughs> I love Tova. I love Tova. She's like boss and I love women like that. So yes, I think we've come a little way. Yeah. But there've been a lot of women, many, many women before me who've had to really fight tooth and nail to be taken seriously. And I remember when I moved to Prime from TVNZ to Prime with Paul Holmes in 2004, a media commentator who since died wrote a scathing column about, you know, how, why on earth did I think that I could be a reporter? What, what? That media columnist had not done any research into my background. He didn't know that yeah. I started as a, a reporter in 1980, uh, 1984, <laughs> three, yeah. and had worked across a number of platforms, blah, blah, blah. He just assumed that because I was blonde and a television presenter that I couldn't be this other thing as well. Wow. There's been a long, tough fight against that kind of attitude. Yeah, I mean, there's, and it's dim- diminishment of women and all. I remember because uh, through the actors' equity thing when Jennifer Ward-Leland and, um, oh, this is something that's just started happening to me, names falling out of very famous Robin, actor. Robin, Robin. Thank Robin, you. Jesus Robin. Christ. Robin Malcolm, yes. Um, <laughs> but Deborah Coddington called them bimbos when they were fighting for the rights of actors. And I was just like, how do you pluck bimbo out of the air? What bullshit is that? Don't. So there's diminishment. You don't, you yeah. don't pluck that out of the air. That is um, that is entrenched. Yeah, exactly. True, yeah. And it may not have been a deliberately chosen word, but it's one that's parked there ready to use and has been super useful over the years to describe <laughs> hardworking, intelligent, yeah. high-achieving women. I don't know. Would you look at Jennifer Ward Leland now and call her a bimbo? I, I just, I just don't think so. No, like when I was funny because Pinky Agnew was my first podcast interview, and she listened to the one that I did with Jennifer, and she said, "I could hear you sitting up straight because Jennifer is such a head girl." <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the best way to describe Jen. She's a head girl, not a bimbo. Absolutely. I interviewed her recently for for the documentary that I'm making. Yeah, and the um, unruly tourists. Correct, and, and correct, I was terrified. Um, she was lovely. <laughs> she's lovely. Like she's the loveliest, but she's just so accomplished. Like yes. mind-blowingly accomplished. You're hardly a slouch. <laughs> well, I was intimidated. I don't know about you, but... Now, now you have moved into yes. this Me Too space, so which, I mean, that must be a, an enormous weight of responsibility on your shoulders to tell everybody's, regardless of gender, stories around sexual violence and harass. I say harassment, but do you say harassment? I've heard you say that. Harassment is, is grammatically correct, but I'm not going to nitpick. Oh, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I get it right sometimes too. Harassment. It sounds like when Catherine Ryan says, it's you. It's you, it's you and harassment. So anyway, I shouldn't make light of it, but you've you've struggled, you're saying a little bit with the weight of responsibility and the the emotional toll that it's taking. So how are you finding yeah, it? Yeah, it's not. Well, I've been doing it day in, day out for four years now. And I think mm. that's been a surprise to everybody, except for me, to think that there are that many you like this to, years, to years. think that there are that many stories to tell. I think a lot of people mm. I know a lot of people thought it would be a complete flash in the pan and it would just dribble away. But unfortunately, you know, it's like those people who work for or run charities, they say, ideally, we wouldn't need to exist. Ideally, this Me Too NZ project wouldn't need to exist because this type of behaviour wouldn't happen. But sadly, there are still people bringing their stories to me, you know, weekly. Yeah, so people are contacting you a lot. 
Oh, correct. Yes, absolutely. Sorry. I mean, there's two reasons for that. Sadly, there's just so many stories still to tell, but also yeah. we have built up a, a level of trust, you know, amongst survivors mm. who know that or have heard that their stories will be sensitively handled and that they won't just yeah. be like their story they're very very sensitive personal sometimes they mm. feel embarrassing story won't be just ripped from their head and run and see you later you know because that's not that's not that's not the way we do things yeah yeah the pastoral care afterwards yeah so the Reporting process for these Me Too stories uh, is incredibly rigorous, much more rigorous than most other reporting because quite often the behaviour you're talking about happens between two people and often in a closed mm. room with no yeah. witnesses. So it's very different from somebody who is the victim of a stabbing, for mm. example. Physical evidence is very difficult to mm. come by. We have to find other ways of stacking up the story to a legally acceptable and, and journalistically acceptable level, and we are incredibly rigorous about that. So in the final approach to publication, it can be quite a tough process. So, you know, I, you're a survivor, even after publication, when normally they feel um, a, a, a sense of relief. freedom. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, a sense of relief uh, and a sense of healing mm. in a lot of cases. Fingers crossed, yeah. But that's not where the care stops. So I have um, a, a number actually of message threads with survivor groups, you know, whose stories were published a year ago or two years ago and, I, and we're in regular contact. So Yeah, right. Um, and, right. I, and I think that's that's really important, but it is a bit unusual. Yeah, and, and so stuff has been really supportive, hey? Enormously supportive, yeah. Mm, mm. Fantastic. Right. And I find it quite interesting. It's been like dominoes. Like every industry has the, like the law with Russell McVeigh. We had comedy definitely had some, we had like a hooey of the women and the, and the comedy industry had some people that were outed. Absolutely. And it's like everyone seems to have this moment and then it falls and it's bloody great to be part of that. And and you you approached stuff with this, right? They You talked to the lady at the top. Yes, I did. This was in early 2018. I was jobless and I was talking after another redundancy and I was talking, <laughs> I was in a meeting room at stuff talking to the wonderful Mark Stevens about a complete different project. There was a knock at the door and Sinead Boucher, who was the CEO at that time and is now the owner, of course, popped her head in on the way to the airport just to say hi. And I kind of shot out of my chair and started babbling at her. I think in the business they call this an elevator pitch. Indeed. But indeed. it was really just a two minutes of verbal diarrhea on, on my part where I said to her, I've got this idea. Can you listen to my idea? So I told her about it. I don't know whether it made sense, but she, there was a little pause and then she said, yes, yes, come here and do that. And then she left Amazing. to go back to Wellington. Later, we worked out the how long might it take and how many people would you need, but she didn't say anything to me in that moment about, you know, oh, how much will that cost? She just said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Do that. Fantastic. And I was so, like, I'm overcome even telling that story four years later because, mm. I mean, look, working for stuff really, I've got to admit to you, is the first time I've been treated as an adult. And as we have already established, I'm 56 mm. years old. Fuck. Um, right. This is really the first time I've been treated as a grown-up. In the media space. Who knows her stuff. Yeah, well. It, yes. That's correct. And that would have been different if you were a man. Uh, well, not being a man, I... I couldn't tell you, but I you don't suspect know. so. Yeah. But there is some infantilizing of all, you know, whenever you do. Like what we were in a taxi as a group of comedians and the taxi driver said, oh, don't make a mess or something. And it was just like, what? <laughs> you know, it's just these people have these notions. Yeah. And there's a lot of control in the media too, I have found. But yeah. that's great that you are treated with respect as an esteemed journalist who has a track record and you're doing some shit hot stuff. And and winner of the Reporter of the Year Award. When was that? Uh, in 2021 at the National Journalism Awards. Last May. So it's coming up a, It's coming up again. I have to give my cup back. Yeah, I should have. <laughs> that should be in the introduction. I apologise. <laughs> yeah, you really should put that in the introduction. I needed you to do my research. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, um, I think we should get, now that we've talked for a long, but I think this is a nice sort of segue into my first question, my first official question, which is what has your relationship with your body been like in your life and what journey has it been on? So I'm curious about that. Oh, yeah. Penny, that's a big question. It really is, isn't it? Uh, okay. Let's start at the very beginning. I come from a long line of skinny people, right. tall, skinny people. I have wonderful genes, and which I'm super grateful for. And not everybody has that. Mm. So I already fit, but well, being not a person of colour and being tall and being genetically thin, although I have been, you know, I have had challenges with my weight throughout various stages throughout my life. I'm already massively privileged in the body space. Mm. I have never had to think about my weight as a kid. Uh, my metabolism changed a bit at 17 and I was at that stage in my final years at high school at an all-girls school, probably the most toxic environment you could find. <laughs> And I, everybody has to have a specialty in high school and my, I made calorie counting my specialty. So people used to come to me before they'd go to the tuck shop and say, Ali, how many calories in a pack of twisties? And I'd tell them <laughs> right off the top of my head. Wow. So dieting, despite the fact that I did not need to diet, um, was, this is the early 1980s, mm. was a big feature for many years. It no longer is. Yeah, so look, this is a long way of saying I've had the same checkered history with my body as any any other woman has. Mm, mm. And and what about in having children? Did that change how you felt about yourself? Not really. I was fortunate there. I didn't have any, um, apart from a retained placenta when my first baby Paris was born, which led to a quite a horrific uh, experience in a theater like an operating theater oh, right. when I was <laughs> awake. I'm not going to I'm not going to describe it cuz it's just too horrific. But anyway, while you were awake. Well, yeah, it's kind of twilight. Yeah, I was awake mm, throughout it. Right. They basically the obstetrician who was luckily a small woman with small hands had to put her fist up and drag it out. Wow. You might want to leave that out of your podcast. I mean, I don't, it if was, you don't. Like, yeah. I, this is what I love about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no holds back. I'm like, go right ahead. Basically, I was drugged at the time but awake. And, and the one thing I remember is um, it must have been a teaching hospital because it was National Women's before it closed down because there seemed to be a lot of people in the room. Oh and I remember thinking, well, just about all of National Women's has now seen right up my jack seat. Wowzers. All good. And were you on telly at the time? Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, not at that moment, but <laughs> God forbid. It was a whole different type of expose with Alison Moore. <laughs> yeah, that was oh. right at the, that was the right at the height of my television career. I was reading the news the day before. Wow. Like I was reading the news right, right up until I went into labor. Yeah. Right, which is good that they didn't banish you, you know, sometimes as they do with very pregnant yeah, ladies. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We never, that, that never came up. Which is no. great. Fantastic. Even though I was enormous as a pregnant woman, enormous. They, right. they did park me in the back, right in the back row of the um, publicity photo. So just my little moon face right. was showing. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. I see. So you had a, a fist, a fist is not a fistula, <laughs> but right. Okay. That's, that's nice. Lovely. I know, no, lovely. Yeah. I didn't have any stretch marks or, what? or any, you know, what? Made, I know. So lucky. I'm so elastic. I've got fucking stretch marks. I didn't have any stretch marks, and no scars or anything like that from two children. Oh my God. But of course, you know, my body has changed a lot to my great sadness in recent years. I see. Right. So is and is that as a result of the estrogen leaving you itself, do you think? Or I'm uh, assuming so. Yeah. I'm assuming so. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you know anything about menopause? Not really. Um my mum had a radical hysterectomy, is what they used to call it. I don't know whether they call it that anymore. At about the age right. of for, in her early forties. So I didn't watch her go through right. a and I'm putting this in air quotes because you know, normal is subjective and normal men menopause. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm assuming that these ills of which I speak are because of it, but I didn't know much about it. And I have to say, lest, you know, and I know you'll all hate me for this, but I, I really haven't had much 
in the way of symptoms either. Sorry. <laughs> No, no, this is, I want to reflect the full gamut of female and trans experience when it comes to menopause. So, and you're quite interesting Mm -hmm. anyway. So this is all fine. But what, so I think a radical has, they probably removed her ovaries back then, but now they don't do that so much with a hysterectomy. Oh, really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. The whole lot came out. Yeah. Yeah. The whole lot came out. And so did she not start having hot flashes and stuff like that when that happened or did she just not talk about it? Oh, I don't know. Mm. That kind of thing would not have been discussed. Oh, really? In my house. Yeah. How was she with puberty and stuff? Well, I remember being very proactive about that. Right. Like, and I had an older sister, remember? So my sister, my lovely sister, Lisa, is three years older than me. So I learned most things from her. Um, and I have a younger sister, Samantha, as well, who's seven years younger. So I taught her all that shit. Right. So I just remember going to going up to mum and saying, I've got my period and I'm going riding this afternoon. Can you help? And she's like, oh, Here's a pad, and I'm like, no thanks. No, no, I'm wearing jodhpurs, mum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not going to work Yeah, for me. It was like that too when I started. A lot was like, oh, you don't want to go straight to tampons. I'm like, yes, I do. I'm about to go to ballet. I definitely yeah. want to go straight to the tampons. <laughs> yeah, correct. Because like, uh, you're doing an arabesque in a lady's face. <laughs> doing this nonsense is not going to, to no. stop me pursuing no. my passions. Yes. But also my mum is English my mum is the epitome of the English rose Ah. still and she grew up in quite a strict conservative household so although she was an it was is an incredibly loving mama she and pretty open because I mean she married an Australian you know a hard drinking Australian journalist so like she was kind of forced into the we we say whatever's on our mind kind of right. routine early on, but she's she did come from quite a conservative background, so right. yeah, so didn't talk about it so much, right? So then for you, so did you learn about it from your sister, or did you just start? What sort of in your minimal tiny symptoms? Which ones did you did you get? Oh, from of menopause. Yeah, yeah. Well, I get a bit hot, you know. <laughs> right, get a bit sometimes. get a bit hot sometimes. I get a bit hot, <laughs> yeah. uh, but generally. So, like, I've got friends, I've got a couple of friends who are some years older than me who I have watched go through it and who've had terrible symptoms, Mm. you know, and these are high-powered women who've had to kind of tear off their clothes in boardrooms because they have a hot flush that is so intense. Mm. So I understand it can be really difficult to manage and I had a a bit of that quite mildly early on Mm -hmm. where I would have to you know I'd be sitting in a jacket and I have to take the jacket off and then I'd have to put it back on five minutes later but generally now I just might get a bit hot at night right I feel terrible (laughs) saying this but really that's that's it I just get a bit hot in bed at night yeah well kind of has your period stopped oh yeah long ago oh oh. (laughs) <laughs> How long ago? I was right on the. I they well they say fifty two is they when do. it kicks in, and I was right on the button at fifty two. Yeah, and at your period just stopped, and that is it. No brain fog, no twitching vagina. Oh, oh, I don't know. You'd have to talk to my nearest and dearest for that. I mean, <laughs> yes, uh, no. I don't have any physical symptoms. Wow. So if you want to talk about bits, I'm happy to talk about bits. Do we have to talk about bits? Yeah, I mean it's it's whatever you want to talk about, but if your bits are fine. I have no I ha- I have no bit symptoms. <laughs> bit symptoms. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> uh, but um but I I do um forget what you're gonna say. Search for words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and where I put things. Yeah, right. And my family, with great glee, like to say that it's because I'm blonde. Right. I'm not really blonde. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I'm not really a redhead. I've either. just been blonde for a long, long, yes, long time. Snap, yes. But I, I, you know, I haven't looked into it. But I'm assuming that you know, and I do have to try hard to stay on the ball these days. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think the work that I do is really, really, really helpful. In what way? I think the well. It is so heavily details oriented. If you don't get every I dotted and every T crossed, everyone, um, then you get sued. Yeah, totes. Or, or stuff gets sued. Yeah. And I don't want that. And 
Touch wood, my dear, I've never been sued. Yeah. And I think that that, that level of attention to detail, you know, f- making your brain work that hard every day is helpful, yeah. Yeah. I assume. I'm hoping that trying to remember 75 minutes of dialogue in a theatre show is a similar deal. Not that I've done that oh, for a while. Oh, <laughs> absolutely, 100%. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And you know what? And I... 100%. It'll be that I, yeah, yeah, it feels like it might be the light at the end of the tunnel now, but it's just taking a washing of the country with Omicron before I can get back to doing what I do, which feels weird as Mm. well. But, and I Mm. must say that for me, when I've seen stuff published through you over this length of time, it's gotten to the point where I go, well, if it's there, it must be true. So that's well done. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we've got the results on the board. Yeah, that's exactly right. There were people, there was one memorable naysayer right at the the launch of the project who wrote a column that said things like well how do we even know we've got a problem with sexual harassment in New Zealand just because the US has a problem with it with Harvey Weinstein and stuff doesn't mean that that we do here who was that and that completely blew my mind no I would love to say but I can't I can't remember Mike Hosking memorably said it would be a bunch of stories about bum pinching wow which is uh, which is assault. Yeah, yeah. Pitching bums is assault. Do you know what? I've decided that my, I'm going to rename my period Mike Hoskin <laughs> because it just goes just goes on and on and on <laughs> and on and won't stop oh. and won't stop when I want it to. So yeah, that's what's happening to me currently. That's what I've oh, decided. Yeah. I'm, so funny. yeah. Anyway, but yeah. which I've never thought I'd name anything coming out of there, Mike Hosking, but I think it's appropriate. Yeah. But anyway, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I'm pretty sure it was a column in the National Business Review. Right. That said, you know, how, you know, mm. how does Ellie Morton even know we've got an issue? Yeah. Um, every every country in the world has I mean, an issue with sexual harassment, fuck. I'm afraid. That's just the way it is. Why, why would we, we be so arrogant to think that New Zealand doesn't suffer from Especially from because we have so much toxic masculinity mm. in New Zealand as well, which is sort of inherently linked with the blokey attitude and stuff like that, which often leads to this as well. And, mm. you know, and then that plays into both genders feeling, you know, men who've been sexually harassed feel weird about coming forward because that speaks volumes to them about what men are supposed to be as well so of course oh, we have it in absolutely Zealand. yeah the yeah. men that I've dealt with that the male survivors that I've dealt with have been incredibly courageous and that's not to take anything away from the courage of the women survivors but mm. um there is that extra layer I've written yeah. about that actually I've written columns about that right. um there is that extra layer of I don't know self-imposed shame or yeah. embarrassment or that, you know, this is not what men do. Yeah, this doesn't happen um, to that men. That makes it yeah. an incredibly huge hurdle for them to get over, yeah. Absolutely, and come forward, yeah. Yes, yeah, I remember I remember the pushback when you first started. I'd forgotten about that. There was that memorable cartoon, which I have saved oh, on my yes. um, on my desktop, just to remind me, which was drawn by Al Nisbet. Oh, fucking Al Which Elmer's had yeah. me... Me slash us women as witches riding on broomsticks. Yeah, I remember that. Which I guess was a play on the the idea that we this was a witch hunt, yes. which you know fundamentally misunderstands what witch hunts are actually are. But exactly. anyway, there was a lot of confused thinking around it at the time, and and my point is nobody thought that it would a work, mm. you know, mm. b be sustainable. Mm. And here we are four years later. Yeah, Mm. exactly, with no lawsuits. Yes, I mean, it's to fundamentally misunderstand that witch hunts were a misogynistic expression of society at the time. And so then to use that as a tool to beat you with is fucking so, yeah, brain dead. (laughs) Anyway, so now Mm. have you decided, have you talked to your daughter about menopause at all? Are you passing that or are you just waiting till later? Uh, Not not yet. Um, My daughter and I are super close we speak every day she lives in Melbourne oh right and we speak every day which is often too often you know because (laughs) when you've talked yesterday and and you're in lockdown and nothing's happened yeah you tend to sometimes we get a bit crabby with each other because there's no new yeah so why do you why do you do it um uh because it's you know it's our thing all right it's our thing and I've got to the stage where if I don't hear from her every day you I get a bit antsy, yeah. Right, okay. um, but it's just become our thing, and and we've got to the stage where 
if there's nothing to say, we just go, oh, there's nothing to say, so I'll talk to you tomorrow. Well, you could tell her about menopause. (laughs) Well, I could, and I will. Yeah. But but I haven't I haven't done that. I mean, I suppose I've mentioned it in passing, mm. but I haven't kind of sat her down to have the talk mm. like I did when they were teenagers with sex yeah. and, you know, memorably parking them in the car and uh, driving to a haircut and having a conversation about anal sex. That was a highlight. What, for them too? And my poor kid. <laughs> Oh, yeah. This was with my son. Sorry, Joel. Sorry. Oh, no, that's that's great. But it's interesting that we don't do that so much around menopause. But, I mean, hopefully that this – because it seems like there's a real shift in that. And, obviously, it's not applicable to her oh, yet. Just recently, it is extraordinary. I mean, yesterday I heard – yesterday, day before, I heard an interview about how some companies are considering special leave yeah. for – people suffering symptoms of menopause and I was like oh my god that's mind-blowing like that never would have happened in my day no and you wouldn't have had to anyway (laughs) I'll tell you a story actually from that's a wonderful illustration about how long this kind of issue has been going on and how it manifests itself in the workplace and I wasn't menopausal at the time but Back when I was presenting The Breakfast Show, Paul Henry and I, I'm sure Paul won't mind me telling the story, had a an ongoing tussle about the air conditioning in the studio. Those television studios, as you know, are like ice boxes. And, mm. you know, there was a disparity in the clothing that we were wearing because Paul was always in a shirt and a jacket and I would often be in a sleeveless top and I would be freezing and he would be a bit hot and I would go into the control room at 6 30 and say can we have the air conditioning turned off please and they would go okay Ellie and then 10 minutes later he would go in and say can we have the air conditioning turned on please and they would go okay Paul and it just went back and forward and back and forth right okay but that idea about temperature regulation is really important I think for women workers of all ages and types and yeah and in menopause of course it flips because it can be very uncomfortable to be in an overheated situation when you're menopausal yeah. and having hot flashes so yeah 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 yeah, and that's exactly why these concepts of having menopause policies and workplaces and stuff like that is just so important and is quite revolutionary. And there's a lot of women yeah. pushing for that. I interviewed a woman in the UK who's like the the menopause revolution MP in Parliament. So it was awesome talking to her. She's just got an absolute fire in her belly. They have one of those? Yeah, they have anyway, It's called the you know, hashtag menopause revolution, and this woman <laughs> is really pushing wow. to get a lot of legislation that's and fantastic. stuff. Yeah, and, and Louisa Wall is picking it up here, as she did with period poverty. So she's all over that. Uh, and same-sex marriage. Love her. Well, of course. Yes, of course. Pertinent to your interests mm. as well. And mine as a marriage <laughs> celebrant. So, yeah, absolutely. So now, so you didn't have to seek any special treatment, obviously, or anything like that? No, I haven't. I mean, I, I wouldn't rule it out, though, because, right. you know, I'm still, I don't, I don't want to use the word suffering. I'm still experiencing symptoms. And I think I have a new one. Oh, Okay, so this is potentially really important and I've only just realised that it might be linked to menopause. How bizarre. Mm. Halfway through last lockdown, I started to experience extreme anxiety for no reason. Yep, Yep, absolutely. So I would be sitting watching Netflix. I would have just spoken to all my nearest and dearest. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing pain point that I can't you know, actually physically see my children at the of moment because they're both in Australia. Yeah. And I've hugged I've hugged my I've seen my son for eight hours in the last eighteen months. Mm. So that's makes me cry on the regular. Mm. But there did, didn't seem to be any reason for any real reason for the anxiety that I was feeling. Like I it would wash over me and I'd think, oh, something's wrong, something's wrong. And then I would check back through myself and find that no, there was nothing wrong. There was no lawsuit pending or, you know, my kids and all my, you know, my family weren't in any day. You yep. know, do you know what yep. I mean? You kind of go through the checklist yep. and I'd go, well, but, but my stomach is still in knots. What is this? And I went to Queenstown to celebrate one of my best friend's birthdays in December and I was talking to her about this and she goes, it's menopause, duh. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. She said, that's one of the main symptoms, Ellie. So plainly, I haven't done my research very yeah, well yeah, yeah. on menopause. So I wouldn't rule out going to see my wonderful female GP, who I've known for 35 years. Wow. And getting some HRT maybe, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, maybe. I don't have a history of breast cancer in my family so that might yeah. be an option yeah yeah for yeah me. absolutely yeah that is an absolute textbook and that's why I think it's so important for us to know all these things because yeah. that could be something that could really derail someone yeah. thinking they've suddenly developed a mental illness right. etc so yeah well I'm right. glad you did that I mean it has helped to understand what it might be what might be causing it so already I'm yeah a bit better than I was so, absolutely yeah. right so you're like as soon as you diagnose something then you can treat it so yeah. fantastic mm. Right, well, I think I probably held you up enough. But is there anything else you wanted to talk to talk about around menopause or what you're doing? Uh, look, I'd just like to say that to me, the discussion that we're having globally about menopause, and it's in- incredibly new, don't you think? Really, really new. Oh my God. It feels very fresh. Like two years, maybe, you know, right. like, and particularly in the last six months. Yeah. Yeah. And so the discussion we're having internationally about menopause is so so important because not just for reasons of physical comfort or that uh, that you know more women might go and see their doctor about it but just so that capable women at the top of their game don't suddenly think that they're losing their minds you know exactly exactly yeah Mm -hmm. and that they can start to be a bit kinder to themselves and hopefully the workplace of course is a big focus of mine they can other people will also understand that if you lose your thread for a minute, that doesn't mean your work is any less good or any less valuable or, you know, if you have to go out of, out of the room and stand under the air conditioner for a minute, it doesn't make you any less than, you know. That's that, exactly that right. massively mm. important. Yeah. I, I'm absolutely 100% committed to advancing this discussion in any way I can. Thank you, Penny, for the opportunity. You're welcome. No worries. Thanks for being here. I just think as women, we often feel, use any excuse to kind of think, oh, well, I'm I'm not as good as, uh, and that's not true. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and a lot of women are scared to bring this up because they think it will show a weakness because women have traditionally had enough to put up with in the workplace. But I feel like the more it's out there and the more it's understood, then the more empathy we can have. Correct. Mm. Mm. Right. Well, I'm going to have to go because the construction that I have tried to get to happen at my house for mm. months has suddenly started happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your mahi. That's right. This is really important yeah, and well I think you're wonderful. And thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks, love. And, and you know, and I bloody love what you're doing as well. It's a mutual congratulations, no, really society, is. all around. So thanks, Penny. Ex- enjoy your moistness. And <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I'll see you another Can't time. You okay, bye-bye. And that was the wondrous Alison Moore, who is doing such brilliant work in the Me Too space, and long may she reign, with her very lucky menopause, which is great as I do want to showcase all the manifestations of the menopause. So please, please, please share this podcast so as many women as possible can learn about what might happen to them. And hey, give it five stars wherever you can review things. Go on. Now, an update to VNN, Vagina News Network. I had been using Ovestin Topical Estrogen Cream internally for about a month, without a lot of change, I have to say, though, after reading Nikki Bizant's excellent menopause book, This Changes Everything, I have shifted to using it externally, as that's where the burning is. Yes, that brief musical duo I had with my husband Matt called The Burning Sensations now seems prophetic. Anyway, I think it actually is helping a bit now though, because I did actually skip two days, because you're supposed to initially use it every day for two weeks, then go down to three times a week. But I didn't take it for two days, da- take it, but you know what I mean. I didn't smear it uh, for two days in a row, and it definitely felt a lot worse. So I've gone back to using it every day externally, and the improvement has been quite clear. It's also interesting that it gets better around my period time. I guess I'm just oozing a bit more estrogen at this point. So this must be the trial and error for treatments that we hear so much about. And I cannot believe that all this has started since I started this podcast. The timing is impeccable. 
The most horrendous and hilarious book I have read this week is Me and My Menopausal Vagina by Jane Lewis, which documents her frankly horrendous story of vaginal atrophy, where she compares her vaginal vestibule to a shot pigeon. But I think everyone should read it because A, then you will know some of the preventative things that you can do, and B, you will feel much better about whatever is happening to you. And it is very funny. Anyway, enough from me. As per usual, you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and my website, hotpink.co.nz. If you wanted to contribute to the making of this podcast, that would be great because all my work is gone forever. Please head to Patreon and search for my name and help spread the word, Chris Hipkins. And in the immortal words of my very first guest, Pinky Agnew, stay juicy, everyone. I'm Penny Ashton. Ka kite. Ka kite.